قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هل يستوي الذين يعلمون والذين لا يعلمون إنما يتذكر أولو الألباب صدق الله العلي العظيم Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat اللهم صل على محمد وعلي As we commemorate the martyrdom of the commander of the faithful Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam on such a night it is important for us to realize that we are commemorating a man who was the symbol of knowledge a man who carried the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth after the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. we are commemorating a man who was the gate to the city of the knowledge. Because the Prophet wasallam said, I am the city of knowledge and Ali is the gate. If you wish to enter this city and seek its wisdom, then there is only one way to it and that is through Ali ibn Abi Talib We are commemorating a man whom Al-Bayhaqi, one of the Sunni respected scholars, he mentions, he narrates a hadith from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, about the scholarship of this man. He quotes the Prophet, peace be upon him, saying, Man arada an yanzura ila Adam fi ilmi. If you want to see the knowledge of Adam, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا وَمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَنْظُرَ إِلَىٰ نُوحٍ فِي تَقْوَاهِ If you want to see the piety of Prophet Nuh. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَنْظُرَ إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ فِي حِلْمِهِ And if you want to see Prophet Ibrahim in his patience and perseverance. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَنْظُرَ إِلَىٰ مُوسَىٰ فِي هَيْبَتِهِ And if you want to see the glory of Prophet Musa. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَنْظُرَ إِلَىٰ عِيسَىٰ فِي عِبَادَتِهِ And if you wish to look at Prophet Isa السلام, in his ibadah, in his worship, then what do you have to do? فَلْيَنْظُرْ إِلَىٰ عَلِي ابن أَبِي طَالِبْ عَلَيْهِ السلام. Let him look at the face of Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him. اللهم صل على محمد We are commemorating such a man on such a night. It was Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, who said, I swear by Allah, not a single verse of the Quran wasn't revealed except that I knew exactly why was it revealed. Where was it revealed? Whom was it addressing? Not only was he the most knowledgeable about the Holy Quran after the Prophet but he was also the most knowledgeable about the sunnah of the Prophet. Because in one hadith, Aisha says, Ali ibn Abi Talib was the most knowledgeable one about the sunnah of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi alayhi. Towards the end of his life, once he was sitting on the pulpit in the mosque, and he made such a powerful statement. No other human being besides the Prophet ﷺ could make such a statement. He said, Saluni qabla an tafqiduni. Ask me before you lose me. For I swear by God, I am more knowledgeable about the paths of the heavens than the paths of this earth. And then he made a beautiful statement. He said, if I were given the opportunity, I would rule the people of the Torah, the Old Testament, meaning the Jews, with their book, the Torah. And I would rule the Christians with their book, according to what's revealed in the, test, in the New Testament, 
that Allah revealed to Prophet Isa salam. No one can surpass the knowledge of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And discussing the knowledge of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam is a vast ocean. There is no end in sight. It gets deeper and deeper the more you sail in the ocean of Ali ibn Abi Talib's knowledge. However, on such a night, as we are commemorating the symbol of knowledge, we have to take a look at ourselves and at our global societies. Have we honored Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in his pursuit of knowledge? When you look at our societies around the world, in the Muslim world and particularly in the Arab world, have we honored the knowledge of Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, have we followed his footsteps in praising knowledge, in demonstrating knowledge, in living and dedicating our entire lives for the sake of knowledge? I tell you, when you look at some of these statistics that reveal the ignorance that we have in the Muslim world and particularly in the Arab world, it's truly disappointing. Research studies have shown that the average American, for example, reads 11 books per year. The average. Some more, some less. The average British citizen reads 7 books. The average Arab, how much does he read? How much do you think? 6. 6 what? 6 books? 6 pages. The average Arab citizen, brothers and sisters, according to recent studies, reads an average of six pages per year. Per an entire year. We're taking the average, of course. Out of these 300 million Arabs, you have six minutes or six pages every single year. Isn't that a disaster? And we wonder why, why we're in such a Desperate situation. Why our region is in chaos. The lands of the prophets and the imams, why are they in chaos? Today there is an estimated 60 to 90 million Arabs who are illiterate in the Arab world. 60 to 90 million. Today in 2015, they are illiterate. And even in wealthy countries like the Emirates, 1 in 10 is illiterate. We're talking about 10% of the population in the UAE who are illiterate despite their wealth, despite their economy, yet 10% of their population is illiterate. Isn't this a disaster? Only 22% of Arabs regularly read. Only, that's it. Almost 80% don't read if they read only occasionally. When you look at these statistics, they're baffling. When you see the number of Arab people going to libraries, it's very few. Hardly do they even visit a library. Hardly do they go with their families to a library. In addition to all of that, if you count the number of books that have been translated into Arabic for the last thousand years, since the 8th, 9th century, how many do you think it is? For the last 1,000 years or so, only about 10,000 books have been translated into Arabic. Compare that with Spain. Every year they translate 10,000 books. And for the last 1,000 years in the Arab world, only 10,000 books have been translated. 1,000 years equivalent to one year in Spain. And when you look at the spending, Allahu Akbar, you know with only six billion dollars, the Arab nations can eliminate and eradicate illiteracy. All these 60 to 90 million people who are illiterate, with simply six billion dollars, they can remove that, they can erase that. And don't tell me they don't have the wealth. The Arab nations combined, Every year they spend 1.1 trillion dollars on military expenditures. Defending themselves from outside forces, from who? Killing each other. That's what they're doing. The Arab nations, they spend 500 billion dollars on tobacco. And they can't spend 6 billion to eradicate illiteracy. This is the disaster that we're seeing today.
And we wonder why the world is in a mess, especially in the Holy Land, from Mecca all the way to Karbala. What's going on? It's because we have abandoned scholarship, because we have abandoned the knowledge that the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, brought forth to humanity. If we want to honor Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, on such a night, we as a community need to realize the importance of knowledge, even for those of us who are studying here, who are living a successful life in the West. How true are we to the teachings of Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, in pursuing knowledge? How serious are we about increasing our knowledge? Knowledge is extremely significant. You know, there are many factors that determine your rank on the Day of Judgment. Yes, your good deeds, your sincerity, how hard you worked. These are all very important factors. But the most important factor or one of the most important factors that determines your rank on the Day of Judgment is the amount of knowledge that you have. This is what determines your rank on the Day of Judgment. Because knowledge is extremely important. We realize this in our societies. Who is more important to our societies and has a higher rank? An average factory worker or an inventor? One who's used his knowledge to invent something. Who has a greater rank? A teacher or the one who has come up with the theories that the teacher is teaching? Or the one who has written the textbooks. We realize this in our everyday lives. That people of knowledge, they command so much respect. And they have such a high rank in society. There's one amazing aspect of knowledge. And that it is this tool which expands your existence. You may wonder, what do you mean? How does knowledge expand my existence? There's only one type of existence. Either I exist or do not exist. What does it mean for knowledge to expand my existence? Yes, knowledge has the power to expand your existence. Take a small baby duck as an example. What's the difference between you and a duck? Aside from the fact that the duck quacks, of course. But what's the difference between you and a duck? You both exist, right? You're both living, you're not dead. But what's the difference? The difference between you and the duck is your capacity to know. Is the awareness that you have about your existence. So yes, the duck exists and you also exist. But there's a difference between your existence. You have a greater existence. Because knowledge has the power to increase your existence. To increase its capacity, to extend it and to expand it. Absolutely. That's why the joys that you have is greater than an animal, than a baby duck. Because with knowledge comes joy. Knowledge brings you more joy. You as a human being, because of your intellectual capacity, there are types of joys that you have which the animals don't have. Many of us, we enjoy being leaders, being in a leadership position. It's a source of joy for us. Many of us enjoy being CEOs. We enjoy being praised in society. Have you seen an animal that enjoys being praised? Because their existence is limited. They don't comprehend this type of joy. We have so many different joys in our lives. I know some people, one of their greatest joys is to know that a member of the opposite gender is in love with them. For them, that's the best joy in the world and the best feeling in the world. That there are people who love me. There are people who pursue me, who find me attractive. This is a source of joy for them. I tell you, one of the greatest sources of joy that surpasses all of that is the joy of knowing, is the joy of knowledge. There is nothing that can surpass that. There was once a scholar all night long. He was trying to solve a scholarly problem a scholarly equation 
when he found the answer to it, he became so joyful and so happy, it's as if he was given the entire world. He said, where are the kings and the sons of kings from this joy? I'm enjoying my life more than the kings because I have the joy of knowledge, because I have the joy of scholarship. When you look back at your life when you, was a, when you were a child, when you look back at your childhood and you look at the types of joys that you had, they were very different, right? When you look at the joys that you had and how you had fun, it appears very silly to you right now. If you, were to, if you were told that you should enjoy yourself like you did 20 years ago when you were a young child, you would laugh at that. It looks very silly. Because now you have grown in your existence. Your knowledge has expanded. You have found different types of joys. And this is the joy that the human being can achieve through the path of knowledge, respected brothers and sisters. On such a night, if we want to honor Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, we must realize the significance of knowledge. And we must use every moment of our life to pursue knowledge so we can expand our existence and we can even expand our joys. In a beautiful narration, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi Allahumma salli alayhi. He describes to us the essence and the importance of knowing and that only through knowledge can you find your worth. Without knowledge, there is no worth. That's why the Prophet in one hadith says, The most people who have value, who have worth, are those who have the knowledge most. And those with the least value are those with the least knowledge. Because knowledge gives you worth. Knowledge gives you value in your society and also in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you examine the narrations of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in demonstrating to us how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves for us to pursue knowledge, they are truly mind-boggling. One hadith from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, he says, Man salaka tariqan liyatluba fihi ilman. If you open for yourself in this life a pathway to knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open a pathway to paradise for you. You want a path to paradise? It's the pathway to knowledge. And then the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says, and the one, a student of knowledge, the one who is pursuing knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispatches the angels so they can lower their wings for him. What an amazing blessing from Allah. Allah sending His pure angels for you to lower their wings, which is a sign of humility, humbleness. Yes, the angels will humble themselves before you if you seek knowledge. They are satisfied with you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is satisfied with you. When the angels lower their wings for you, you are protected by the angels. Allah is glorifying your position. You are blessed by His pure angels. And then the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, those who pursue knowledge, the entire universe, and that which it contains does istighfar for you. They ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you, even the fish of the ocean. Hatta al fil bahr. Allahu Akbar. Yes? Don't be surprised that the fish can also do istighfar for you. Everything in this universe has a level of perception. The Quran is very clear that everything, even a single cell in the universe glorifies Allah, does tasbih. But the Quran says you are not able to comprehend their tasbih or hear their tasbih or understand how they do tasbih. Everything in the universe will do istighfar for a student of knowledge. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the greatness of knowledge. 
One of the amazing benefits that knowledge gives us is that it, it provides us intellectual company. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, in a very beautiful narration, he says, وَهُوَ أَنِيسٌ فِي الْوَحْشَ وَصَاحِبٌ فِي الْوَحْدَ لَأَنَّ الْعِلْمَ حَيَاتُ الْقُلُوبِ The Imam السلام, says, knowledge re removes you from loneliness. It lifts you from solitude, from depression, from loneliness. You know, there are people in this life, and we've seen many examples. They have large families, they have a big circle of friends. There are many people around them. And they're wealthy, they're well off, they're successful, they've got jobs. But deep inside they are lonely. Their soul is lonely. Their soul is starving because they lack knowledge. You can have the people of the world surrounding you, being with you day and night. But if you do not have knowledge, you have no real comfort. Because the Imam says, the real comfort to you is knowledge. When you are experiencing loneliness, it is only knowledge that can save you, that can give you that comfort. And that's why we see in the munajat of Imam Zain al Abidin salam, what a beautiful munajat he has. In Munajat al Arifin, the Imam السلام, has a beautiful line in which he says, he's speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Ilahi waj'alna min al-ladheena tarassakhat ashjaru al-shawq ilayk fi hadaiqi sudurihim fahum ila awkar al-afkar ya'oon. Oh Allah, what beautiful words from an Imam Zain al-Abideen. He says, Oh Allah, make us among those whose chests are like a garden. Look at this beautiful description. Whose chests are like a garden. And you have planted the tree of loving you and longing to you in this garden. Now, how is it that one achieves this garden? I ask you. How do you get this garden in your chest and have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fix the tree of loving Him and missing Him and yearning for Him in that garden? The Imam says, Fahum ila awkar al afkar ya'un. The Imam says, The only path to that, to achieve that, is through knowledge and contemplation. Because these people, they rush towards knowledge. It's their final resort. It's their refuge. They run away from the dangers of life to the shelter of knowledge. And that's how you plant that tree in their hearts. Then the Imam السلام, says, Ilahi ma aladha khawatir al ilhami bi dhikrika ala al -qulub. He says, Oh Allah, how tasty. How sweet, how delicious are those thoughts of knowledge that we have when we think about your greatness. What happens to our hearts? When we think about the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we increase our knowledge. And oh Allah, how sweet is your love, is loving you. But we can only achieve the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by pursuing knowledge. It is the key to success. It is the key to honoring Ali ibn Abi Talib salam on such a night. When you examine the reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to those who seek knowledge, we're truly missing out if we waste a single moment of our lives not pursuing knowledge. In one hadith, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi He says, whoever leaves his home or takes time and effort to pursue knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispatches 70,000 angels to protect him and to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him. 
Where can you get such an honor? 70,000 angels dispatched by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just for you because you are seeking knowledge. In another hadith, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam in a beautiful, amazing narration which describes the importance of knowledge. The Imam alayhi salam says, as for those who pursue knowledge, whether during the day or during the night, they will be faced with oceans of Allah's mercy. وَهَتَفَتْ بِهِ الْمَلَائِكَةِ مَرْحَبًا بِزَائِرِ اللَّهِ Allahu Akbar. You know what the angels will say to those who pursue knowledge, whether during the day or during the night? They will say, welcome, O visitor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can we visit Allah? Yes, of course we can visit Allah. You think you can only visit your friends and family members? You can visit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the angels will welcome you. They will say, welcome, marhaban bizairillah. O you visitor of Allah, because the one who pursues knowledge is actually visiting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, symbolically of course, because Allah is not physical. Why should I deprive myself of this amazing rahmah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me? I will be missing out. Every day you have the opportunity to visit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And is there an honor greater than visiting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In a third narration, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says the one, any human being who pursues knowledge is like the one who fasts the entire day and the one who engages his entire night in ibadah. Then the Prophet peace be upon him says, and believe me if there is someone who has gold the amount, the size of Mount Abi Qubayz, it's a mountain in Mecca. If you have that much gold and you give it away in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's not better than studying and achieving knowledge. Pursuing knowledge has a greater reward than that. You simply imagine. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us such an honor to achieve such an amazing reward, simply by pursuing knowledge, because it's truly an honor for us to pursue knowledge, brothers and sisters. Even on Laylatul Qadr are many a'mal, and we'll get to some of them tonight, inshallah. There are many actions, but the Imams of Ahlul Bayt were asked, what is the best action on Laylatul Qadr? You know what it is? Is it Dua Al-Jawshan? No. Is it Dua Bi Hamza? No. Is it praying 100 rak'ah? No. That's all good. The best deed and the best action to do on Laylatul Qadr is to pursue knowledge. Is to gain knowledge, to expand your knowledge. This is the best action that you can do on such a night. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the greatest blessing for even learning something. Even if it's one single thing that you learn on such a night that has a great status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day a man came to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. He said, if I have one hour to live, what do you advise me to do? The Imam alayhi salam said, pursue knowledge. That's why one of the greatest scholars who had spent his entire life in scholarship and studying, when he was on his deathbed dying, he took out a book and he was studying it. They told him, come on, you've spent your entire life studying and you're such a great scholar. Now you're on your deathbed dying and you still hold on to your book and read? You know what he said? He said, I am ashamed. I am embarrassed to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ignorant. I'm ashamed to meet him in the state of ignorance. And look at our world today. In the state of ignorance. وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَ تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ الْأُولَى The Qur'an in Surah Al-Ahzab indicates that the time of jahiliya, ignorance, there are two types of, there are two times of ignorance. One is the first ignorance and the second one is what we see today. Simply when you look at the statistics that I shared with you, you realize the depth of the ignorance that is plaguing our world. 
He said, I am embarrassed to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this state of ignorance. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in another hadith, he says, وَطَالِبُ الْعِلْمِ حَبِيبُ اللَّهِ You want to become Habibullah? The beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? اُطْلُبُ الْعِلْمِ Simply seek knowledge. Then you become the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the role of scholars and knowledgeable people, you don't have to officially be a scholar. Many of you can be scholars in your own communities simply by pursuing knowledge. And once you achieve that high level of knowledge, your value is more than 1,000 worshippers. Because the Prophet, peace be upon him, in one hadith says, فَقِيهٌ وَاحِدْ أَشَدُّ عَلَىٰ إِبْلِيسِ مِنْ أَلْفِ عَابِدْ One single human being who's learned, who understands, who has knowledge, this person is tougher on Satan, on Iblis, on the Shaytan, than 1,000 worshippers. Because the worshipper only benefits himself. He doesn't benefit other people. Whereas when you have knowledge, you can benefit other people. You can guide an entire society. You can guide an entire generation. That's why you will be tougher and more dangerous to the devil than a worshipper. But that requires humbleness, that requires dedication. It's not easy to pursue knowledge. You have to sacrifice from your time, from your energy, from your busy schedule. And the most important thing, it requires humbleness. Some people, they're arrogant. They're not willing to learn from those who are more learned than them in society. What's wrong if you know a brother or sister in your society who has more knowledge than you, who's learned or who's an expert in, cert <coughs> in certain areas. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali. Al-thani ala hub amir al-mu'mineen. Allahumma salli ala. If someone has more knowledge than you, if someone who is more learned, what's the, what's the problem if you go to them and you humble yourself and you ask them, you learn from them, ask them to guide you, to share with you the experiences that they've had. Yes, we have to remove the arrogance and we have to humble our souls and our hearts in order to seek knowledge. Because the Prophet ﷺ, in one beautiful hadith, he says, مَنْ لَمْ يَصْبِرْ عَلَىٰ ذُلِّ التَّعَلُّمِ سَاعَةً بَقِيَ فِي ذُلِّ الْجَهْلِ أَبَدًا If you can't have the patience to learn for a single hour from someone, you don't have the patience, you find it degrading, you find it that you humble yourself, then you will remain in the humiliation of ignorance forever. If you can't take the humiliation of seeking knowledge for one hour, you will stay in the humiliation of being ignorant forever. Yes, ignorance is the biggest source of humiliation. And that's why when we examine the Arab world today, there is no respect for the Arab world. Why? Because of the lack of knowledge. You think they have respect? They can have all the oil of the world. No one takes them seriously. No one cares about them. No one looks out for their well-being. And the biggest indicator of that is the disastrous situation that we see there. It's because they've abandoned knowledge. That's why the Prophet promised them that they will stay in humiliation for the, forever, till the day of judgment. Except if they lift out themselves from this ignorance. Knowledge gives you pride, it gives you honor, it gives you dignity. It's the greatest source of dignity. You know, one day they said, there was a man who had saved some money for his son. He wanted to do something good to his son. They told him, the best thing you can do, take your son to educate him. So he went, he found a teacher, and he told him, I want you to educate my son. Give him the best education. How much will that cost? 
The, che the teacher calculated, he told him, okay, it's going to cost you 100 dirhams. He told him, what? That much? That's too much. That's a lot more than I imagined. He said, well, education is expensive. You have to be willing to sacrifice so your son could be educated. He says, you know what? No. He had a farmland. He said, I'd rather buy a donkey with that 100 dirham because the donkey can help me in my farmland. We could use it. The teacher told him, that's fine. Look, you can buy that donkey. But let me tell you, you'll end up with two donkeys later. <laughs> that's what will happen. You know, buy one, get the second one free. Knowledge gives you honor, it gives you dignity, it gives you pride, and it lifts you out of humiliation. And this is how we see, unfortunately, many of our societies around the world today. They are in the humiliation of ignorance. I tell you, when you have 60 to 90 million illiterate people in the Arab world, that's not humiliation. That's the biggest source of humiliation. On such a night, if we want to honor Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, we have to make a commitment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to pursue the path of knowledge as much as we can. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam was a fatherly figure for the Muslim society. He was a father for the orphans. He took care of the orphans. But the Ahlul Bayt teach us that there are two types of orphans. There's an orphan who's lost his parents, who's lost his father, who's lost his or her mother. And it's highly recommended for us to help them. The hadith says, if you wipe your hand on the head of an orphan to show that orphan compassion, love and mercy for every strand of hair on the head of this orphan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you 1,000 palaces on the day of judgment. Each palace and paradise is greater than the world and what it contains. This is an orphan who's lost his parents. Al-Imam al-Askari says there is a second type of orphan. And helping this orphan has a greater reward than helping the first type of orphan. Al-Imam al-Askari in a beautiful hadith says, and we have a type of orphan who is orphaned from knowledge, who is orphaned from his imam in our time of ghayba. We are orphaned from our imam. We don't have direct physical access to the imam alayhi salam. We are missing that fatherly figure. We are all orphans indeed. He says the most orphan who's in need is the second type of orphan. He's orphaned from his teachings, from knowledge, from scholarship, from his imam. He says whoever from our Shia takes the hand of this orphan, and he gives him from our knowledge, I promise, يَكُونُ مَعَنَا فِي الرَّفِيقِ الْأَعْلَى I promise that he will be with us in the, highs, in the highest levels of paradise on the day of judgment. If we want to honor the father of orphans on such a night, we honor him through the path of scholarship. We honor him through the path of knowledge. And we take care of the orphans of our society who are orphaned from knowledge, and we take care of our own families, who are orphaned from knowledge and scholarship. Our scholars throughout history exerted so much effort and sacrificed so much so that today in 2015, we have a chance at learning our religion and learning our religious teachings and values. Because the most sacred type of knowledge is for you to know what your religion is. In a beautiful hadith, Al-Imam al-Sadiq says, وَجَدْتُ عِلْمَ النَّاسِ كُلَّهُ فِي أَرْبَعْ The Imam says, when I looked at all the knowledge that is out there, only four types of knowledge are the good types, are the beneficial types. Number one, أَن تَعْرِفَ مَنْ رَبُّكْ To know who your Lord is. To know who your creator is. How much time do we spend on a daily basis to know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. We spend so much time knowing about everything in our society. We spend so much time knowing about 
you know, sport teams, about brands, about everything in society, but how much time do we spend knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The Imam says, know your Lord. Who is your Lord? Because I tell you the greatest joy that the Ahlul Bayt had is when they came to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, even though he was wounded and the arrow was through his feet and it was paining him, giving him so much pain. But when he would start his salah and he would come to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the beauty of knowing Allah distracted him from the pain of the arrow. This is how the Imams of Ahlul Bayt found joy in this life, by coming to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then an Imam al-Sadiq says the second type of knowledge, أَن تَعْرِفَ مَاذَا صَنَعَ بِكْ Know what your Lord did with you. Here comes the role of science. Know how the universe runs. Know the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry, the social sciences. Every cell in your body, you as a believer should know what its function is. Because an Imam al-Sadiq says, مَاذَا صَنَعَ بِكْ How did Allah create you? Examine your creation. See the wonders of Allah's creation. Unfortunately, the Muslim world has disregarded this aspect today. This is the role of science. Imam al-Sadiq in one of his companions, one of his students, Jabir ibn Hayyan, the Imam salam gave him a lesson in chemistry 500 pages long. 1,400 years ago. 1,300 years ago. Can you imagine? The Imam salam back then, in those backward societies, the Imam is spending from his precious, precious time to teach one of his students chemistry. Yes, because it has value in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third one, Mada aradamink? What does Allah want from you? This is an important third type of knowledge. What does God want from me? Allah has created me, He's blessed me, He's given me everything. In return, what does my Lord want from me? What's expected from me? What is my responsibility? In the month of Ramadan, Allah trains us to become pious, God-fearing individuals. Always have Allah on our mind, despite the distractions of this life. You know, Prophet Yusuf salam, this young man, when he was in the palace of Zulaikha, what a difficult test. In the palace of Zulaikha, and she was the most beautiful woman of her time in Egypt. She tried to distract him in every way possible. For seven years he was in her palace, owned by her, she owned him. She bought him as a slave. For seven years in her palace she would look at him, she would speak to him, he would not raise his eyes to look at her. <coughs> After seven years she told him, Yusuf, seven years you're in my palace. You haven't looked at me even once. <coughs> What's wrong with you? Look at me. Your eyes are so beautiful. Look at me. You know what he told her? Look at the taqwa. See how God conscious Prophet Yusuf salam is. He did not allow her to distract him in any way possible. He told her, Oh Zulaikha, if you look at these eyes, when I die in my grave, how they fall from its place and how the earth devours them. Trust me, you will run away from me. You will not say I have these pretty gorgeous eyes. She told him, but oh Yusuf, you smell so good. Your aroma is amazing. He told her, oh Zulaikha, I wish you could see, you could see my body three days after being buried. And this stench that emanates from it, you would run away from it. She tried to distract him, but because he knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he had seen the signs of Allah, he did not allow anything to distract him. Mada arad Allahu mink? Have we asked, us this, asked ourselves this question? What is it that my Lord wants from me? We're always concerned about what others want from us, what our society wants from us, what our government wants from us, what my spouse wants from me, what my parents want from me, what my friends want from me. But the last thing I think about is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from me. 
And the fourth type of knowledge, وَمَا يُخْرِجُكَ عَنْ دِينِكَ And what is it that causes you to exit your religion? Where, what are the red lines? As believers in Allah, do we know the red lines? Do we know what causes us to leave our religion, brothers and sisters? What allows us to exit the religion? Do we know? We have no clue. Sometimes it could be a word that I can say. A word that angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and causes me to leave the religion in the eyes of Allah. Am I aware of those red lines? This is the true knowledge that Imam al-Sadiq summarizes for us. And scholars throughout history have painstakingly reserved and preserved this knowledge for us. We are truly too blessed Blessed to having them throughout history. If you simply come to know the amount that they sacrificed for the sake of humanity, it's amazing. Sahib al-Jawahir, al-Allam al-Jawahiri, this amazing man who has a 40-volume book in Islamic law. You know how he authored this book? Today this book is such an important book in the seminaries. But do you know how he authored this book? He was so poor, he would go to the public restrooms in the middle of the night, that's when he was to write his book, because he had no money to buy a candle in his house. He would go to the public restrooms simply to get the light, because there was few candles there. He would sit there all night long. Can you do that for a single night, brothers and sisters? Can he do that for a single night, for a single hour, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allahu Akbar. This is how our scholars sacrificed in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we want to honor Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, we honor scholarship. We honor the path of knowledge. In our society today, there are many challenges. Islam is under the spotlight. We are accused all types of accusations. The Quran is accused as being a book of violence. They'll take verses out of context and tell you this is a violent verse. This is a verse against women. This is a wife beating verse. This is that. This is this. Do we have the knowledge to answer? I tell you it's an obligation. It's wajib. Every single one of us here tonight. It's wajib upon us to pursue the path of knowledge. Make a commitment now with Ali ibn Abi Talib. Oh Ali, they physically killed you, but they could not kill your knowledge. And I will do my best to uphold your knowledge in my life and in my society. Make a commitment now with Ali ibn Abi Talib. If you don't, you'll be missing out. The challenges are too great. We have to have the answers. We need to know our Quran, the context of those verses. Why they were revealed in order to address these misconceptions. That's how we honor Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Oh Ali, even if they struck you on such a night, they could not take away your knowledge and your scholarship. 